Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the session where we're, unleash we're talking about unleashing venture capital. COVID-19 has dealt dual blows to the Asia-specific prosperity and a sustainable development agenda. As we rebuild, we know that new technologies can help unlock sustainable growth, distribute its benefits more inclusively, and make economies more resilient. It will be critical for ADB developing member countries to unlock private sector investment to make this happen. Falling government revenues and higher public spending on public health and economic stimulus will inevitably constrain public sector resources for green and social investments. In early 2020, ADB's private sector operations department established ADB Ventures a new venture capital arm able to make risk capital investments in early stage clean energy, agricultural technology, circular economy, inclusive fintech, and health technology companies. We saw this as a way to crowd in private sector investment and remedy a, cap, a gap in the market. Many of the technology solutions needed to unlock sustainable growth, distribute its benefits more inclusively, and make economies more resilient already exist. But they are not scaling fast enough in Asia and the Pacific, and especially in emerging markets. This is for two reasons. First, impact-related technologies often require significant amounts of upfront capital. However, venture capital or, venture cap or VC portfolios have tended to be concentrated in developed economies, later stage deals, and self software technologies such as e-commerce. Second, the transaction costs to scale across the Asia Pacific's fragmented markets can be prohibitively high. ADB Ventures is a good start However, mobilizing capital to, su to support a sustainable recovery will require a multi-pronged effort involving a variety of stakeholders, including governments and policymakers, development partners, private sector investors, and of course, innovative entrepreneurs. I'm pleased to be joined here today for, uh, with, on our today, session today with, by five individuals who are all contributing to a sustainable recovery with significant private sector participation from different angles. Mr. Cha, Cha Jung Ho Hoon is Deputy Minister of the Republic of Korea's Ministry of SMEs and Startups. Ms. Ritu Verma is co-founder and managing partner of Anchor Capital, a venture capital firm that has made significant investments in impact-related technology startups in India and the broader Asia-Pacific region. Mr. Jojo Flores is co-founder of Plug and Play, one of the key partners in our ADB Ventures Labs platform, one of the world's foremost early stage venture capital investors and a pioneer in accelerating corporate innovation through partnerships and startups. Mr. Tarun Mehta is co-founder and CEO of Anther Energy, a prominent electric vehicle startup in India, a market suddenly crowded with electric vehicle startups. Anther Energy successfully closed a $35 million US uh, in Series D venture capital fundraising last year. Mr. Christian Sands is CEO of Skycatch, which is both the most recent addition to ADB Ventures investment portfolio and a leader in drone technology for smart infrastructure and smart construction. Thank you to our panelists for joining our session today. The format of today's session uh, will include each of the panelists will share five minutes of pre-recorded remarks, and then I will moderate a live one-hour panel uh, discussion involving all our uh, presenters. And then the panel uh, will get the panel started with a few pre-prepared questions, and then we will field questions from the audience. So let's begin our presentation, starting with Mr. Cha uh, Hyung Jung, uh, Deputy Minister, Ministry of SMEs and Startups, Republic of Korea. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Jung Hun Cha, the Deputy Minister of Startup and Venture Innovation Office at the Ministry of SME and Startup of Korea. 
I know that ADB annual meeting is a very prestigious event with the participation of more than 3,000 people from governments, financial office, officials, and NGO in the Asian Pacific region every year. It is a great honor for me to attend this meeting where uh, participants discuss a way to promote the development of the Asia Pacific region. The Ministry of SME and Start of Korea, uh, where I am working now, is leading the tra transition to the economic structure led by SME and startup in Korea. The ministry is pursuing the various businesses to support companies throughout all stages, from starting a business to growth, such as commercialization, R&D funding, market development, and ent entry into overseas markets. In particular, the Korea government started creating fund of fund to give a boost to the venture investment ecosystems. Currently, about $60 billion of a private venture capital fund has been created and about $19 billion has been invested into startup through fund of fund. Thanks to joint effort of the government and private sector, the Korea's venture investment market is growing every year. In particular, despite COVID-19 situation last year, the performance of fund creation and venture investment was record high. In an environment where social and economic structure is rapidly changing, SME and startup has emerged as a new player who lead innovative in key areas such as digital, uh, non-face-to-face business and biohealth care. The Korea government has established a closer corporate relationship with the Asia Pacific region since the Asian Republic of Korea commemorative summit held in Busan in November 2019. As a part of a corporation, Korea created a $60 million ADB venture fund with the Asian Development Bank in June last year. We support the growth of a startup in the field of clean technology, fintech, and agriculture so that ADB Venture Fund can contribute to the sustainable development of the Asia Pacific region. I'd like to introduce two Korea startups that stand out in the focus area of ADB Venture Fund. Both of them will branch the Asia Pacific market soon. First of all, eGreen Global solved the problem of food shortage by enabling large scale production of quality potato with a tissue culture technology developed by it independently. It is expected that the company can improve the agricultural productivity in the Asia Pacific region, contributing significantly to the sustainable development in the Asia Pacific region. InnoCSR, the second company to be introduced, is solving environmental problems by reducing carbon emissions with the introduction of a new way that incorporates physical and chemical elements away from the traditional brick manufacturing method using a kin. It also contributes to the improvement of employment environment, such as expansion of the regular workers, as stable production is possible throughout the year. The company is planning to enter the Asia Pacific market and is expected to contribute significantly to job creation in the region while helping to reduce the carbon emission and resolve environmental issues based on its clean technology. The Korea government will identify a startup with innovative technology and business model that can contribute to sustainable development like the two companies I introduced to you earlier and support them for their future growth. As such, the Korea government will strive for the sustainable growth of the Asia Pacific region, cooperating with the startup not only in Korea, but also in Asia Pacific region through ADB Venture Fund created jointly with ADB. In recent years, sustainability and ESG have emerged as an important social and economic keyword, not only in Korea, but also around the world. Considering that most field of sustainability was excluded from private sector in the past, I believe the, that movement in the private sector today was possible thanks to the active involvement by of and discussing among government around the world and international organizations. 
The voluntary movement of the private sector is important, but the role of the government to introduce the movement in the private sector and support such movement in suitability uh, should come first. Finally, I hope that today's event serves as an opportunity to promote sustainable development in the Asia Pacific region through a meaningful discussion and we can grow together through cooperation between Korea and Asia Pacific region. Good afternoon, this is Ritu Varma from Angkor Capital. Sustainable redevelopment goals, I believe, is no longer a choice, and we need to use all tools to accelerate people and planet towards these goals. While the UN put this out as a call to countries, I believe it is a call for entrepreneurs and financiers to push the ideas, to push the tools and the kit, and more. Venture capital is one such tool that comes in to back radical ideas, and if it succeeds, changes the game. Technology-backed companies have delivered handsome returns for their investors, but I believe they have also driven inclusivity, brought better healthcare, created radical products, and more. Disruptions in impact and returns are an interesting tool to use to accelerate us towards the SDGs. There are two areas I believe that have a lot high overlap between SDG goals and venture capital. One is when digital and digital enabled businesses are used for drive inclusivity. The second is when there is fundamental innovation of radical products that are aimed at lower resource areas. Both of these approaches have the potential to access large markets grow rapidly, a prerequisite for venture capital, but also a need for SDGs and our need to accelerate our goals faster towards that. Let me talk about the first one. People at the bottom of the pyramid or lower income communities are very hard to reach, very expensive. A doctor in Mumbai can often be cheaper than a doctor in rural Orissa. However, digital, has brought more than 200 pe million people from such markets to watch videos on YouTube every day, contributing to a $170 billion company globally. I believe that such tools and business models, when brought to quality healthcare, quality education, and much more, has a lot, have a large role to play to create impact towards the SDG goals. We have the luxury of backing one such company where they have brought technologies to smallholder farmers. They started out with 3,000 farmers and now serve more than 2.5 million farmers across the globe. The technology allows farmers to integrate with global supply chains. It allows companies as well as financiers downstream to engage with small farm holders, not only inputting uh, in agronomy and how to grow your products better and what to grow, but also contributing to how to grow your crops more sustainably, creating a more climate-friendly planet. Such companies have scale and provided their investors with good returns. I'll remind you that Venture Capital started backing product companies. Silicon Valley gets its name from the chips that were venture-backed in that time. Moderna, was backed by a venture capital firm and today is in the front lines of fighting the pandemic. When venture capital comes in to back innovation that can radically impact people in lower income areas or the climate, that can be a win-win for both SDGs as well as capital. One thing that we see is that such innovations are now happening in these markets, in emerging markets, where entrepreneurs are working with much lower resources to come up with radical innovations. They are sitting in the context of these poorer economies, so their innovations are relevant for those economies as well. This reminds us of the early days of Silicon Valley, where the chips were investable because there was a lot of other things around that help manufacture them without you putting a lot of capital down. 
Similarly, we feel that there are such efficiency and capital efficiency in the way entrepreneurs are approaching product innovations in emerging markets. So we are backed in one such company, a synthetic biology company that uses waste gases like biogas and natural gas to produce feed, food, agri-inputs, and specialty chemicals, removing the pressures on our land resources as well as our ocean resources. Their capital requirements are very low for production, allowing for much greater scalability. We are not alone in backing such companies. Others have backed such companies and seen handsome returns. We're midst of pandemic, which has disproportionately impacted people in lower income areas. Digital learning is non-existent so far. Work from home means unemployment and healthcare infrastructure doesn't exist. It is imperative for us to bring the disruptions to market that accelerate us towards the SDGs. And venture capital is a tool, I believe, that can do that. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jojo Flores, and I'm the co-founder of Plug and Play Tech Center, which I started in Silicon Valley in 2006. Our vision at Plug and Play is to make innovation available to everyone, everywhere. And our mission to making this happen is by creating a collaborative platform where all of the best minds can connect. I moved back to the Philippines in 2013 to oversee our presence here in Asia, including China, Japan, Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, and Korea, which we launched just last month. Plug and Play is the largest global innovation platform. We touch a wide range of industries that often cross-pollinate with each other. Our newest verticals are in the areas of animal health, ag tech, and sustainability, which is really close to my heart. I will dive into this later. In October 2019, Plug and Play officially launched its sustainability platform with its partnership with the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. For those of you who have not heard of the Alliance, it is a nonprofit consortium of 60 plus corporations from around the world and from different parts of the value chain. They have all contributed 10 to $15 million into a collection fund over five years with the goal of deploying capital into projects and startups with a mission of ending plastic waste around the world. Plug and Play's role with the Alliance is to run its global accelerator program. We actively source and vet startups around the world that are focused on tackling plastic waste with their solutions in waste collection, sorting, processing, market exchange, and end-use markets. Here you can see an example of the process for our Silicon Valley Hub on our selection process to find the 10 to 12 best startups to be part of this program. In addition to Silicon Valley, we also run programs in Paris, Shanghai, Singapore, Sao Paulo, and Johannesburg. Since the launch of our program, we have accelerated 32 startups, which has led to 75 plus commercial pilots and POCs. We also helped our batch startups to raise over $35 million in funding from the Alliance and its member companies, Plug and Play and the Plug and Play Network. In addition to our work in plastics, Plug and Play is also launching programs in carbon neutrality and water in all of our regional hubs, including Asia locations in Shanghai and Singapore. The purpose of these additional hubs is to tackle the difficult problems in becoming more sustainable. For carbon neutrality, we are working with innovative startups that can help companies tackle their scope three carbon emissions. We are also aggressively investing in startups that align with the focus areas of our programs and with innovative trends we are seeing in plastics, carbon, and water. We have invested in 17 startups in the last year and a half and we are only just getting started. As we grow our sustainability presence in Asia with the Alliance and ADB, we look forward to investing in exciting startups that are helping make the world more sustainable. Our method of investing in these exciting startups is to first study the entire value chain, then see where the emerging trends are in the startup ecosystem. This graph shows the distribution of over 2,000 startups from around the world and from across the plastic value chain. As you can see, there are parts of the value chain such as biomaterials and waste collection that are oversaturated. There are other parts that need more innovation and investments 
in order to boost up the entire value chain and help move to a truly circular economy. Those parts of the value chain that we are excited about are in biological recycling, chemical recycling, design of plastic to make them easier to recycle, waste material exchange, traceability, and advanced waste sorting. And here in Southeast Asia, we see that there is a need for more investments in advanced waste sorting, traceability, and chemical recycling to boost the entire plastic value chain in Southeast Asia as a whole. For my final slide, I'd like to share with you one case study of an investment we've made in India. Ketos does real-time leak and contamination technology for farms, oil and gas facilities, wastewater treatment facilities, and others. Nina first created her product in 2013 in California before going back to her village in India where she was able to launch and scale the technology to reduce water loss from crops as well as teach women in her village technology and engineering skills. Mina has since grown the company into a water startup powerhouse that has deployed its technology globally to help improve crop health and help water-stressed regions save water. In conclusion, while advancements in technologies have been happening at unbelievable speed, I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg of what is possible and likely to happen in the next few years. We very much look forward to working with all of you at ADB as we continue on this innovation journey. Thank you again for having me today. Stay safe and healthy. Hi everybody, I am Tarun. I am co-founder and CEO of Aether Energy. We are a startup based out of Bangalore and we build smart electric scooters in India. Uh, the topic that I am speaking on today is raising capital for sustainability and entrepreneur's perspective. Quick background about us, um, we began about seven years back. Um, we began originally with an idea to build lithium ion battery packs. Uh, we saw a big opportunity to build battery packs and help accelerate the EV transition in India. Uh, as entrepreneurs, we've been, uh, we, we've been always motivated by contributing towards clean energy and uh, expanding energy access for all. And helping electric vehicles uh, go mainstream was one of the best ways we could see that happen. Um, so originally we saw the problem as battery packs and charging infrastructure and that's where Ether Energy began its journey. Uh, but very quickly, literally in the first few months of existence, we realized that one key problem is access to good products in India. Uh, there are no good electric vehicles, uh, especially back then when we began. Um, so we pivoted and we became an automotive OEM, uh, building uh, electric scooters, uh, premium electric scooters in India. Um, we've been fortunate to have had uh, multiple financing, multiple equity infusions over the years. We've been fortunate to have a fantastic uh, pool of investors that we've been able to tap for this. Um, it's always very hard. Uh, I've heard this, uh, and obviously first-hand experience. It's always very hard to raise capital for in in for hardware uh, sustainability uh, in a developing market, uh, any developing market. Um, our learnings have been it's it's harder because you're competing often uh, you're competing with businesses that can show very early stage traction and very quick one at that uh, whether it's an internet business or a SaaS business uh, or on any of the new hot sectors uh, customer acquisition can 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 happen in the first year itself uh, even in SaaS businesses, year two, year two, year, year two or three is good enough to get customer acquisition going, and a lot of sustainability business models require a lot of product dev uh, and technology integration and development that ends up taking a much longer time frame than that. Uh, B also a lot of uh, a lot of our sectors are in are, are in places where you know things move slower. You can't respond. You can't pivot like uh, software. So the ability to respond to the market is usually a little limited. This creates a lot of entry barriers for investors because you will typically hear a conversation like, give us cash and um, with this we'll build a better prototype. And then give us cash and with this, this will build a better prototype. So um, it's hard for a lot of standard growth metrics to 
it's very hard for VCs to use standard growth metrics to evaluate how you've grown as a company. Um, and models around product development, models around impact, models around scale that you will eventually have are, are not very well understood. This is the first big problem in raising capital. Um, second is just the number of investors who have a mandate to invest in these sectors is still fairly finite and fairly limited. It's improved dramatically since since we began seven years back, definitely in India. But I would still say it's, it's nowhere close to where the software uh, and, the, and the internet businesses are. Um, having said that, uh, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, our experiences have been this is this is fewer investors but the ones who do take a bet do take often a very long term bet so generally you will be able to attract very patient investors i know a big concern that all of us always have have had is are investors going to be patient for this business model honestly in our experience it's, it's very binary either they are going to be patient or they're not going to be patient and they're not going to put money uh, it's it's very hard to attract an impatient investor actually on your cap table so the good news is the investors that you will attract uh, very good chances of you know uh, them being uh, them really knowing what they're getting into uh, and being really fairly patient. Second learning, big learning has been um, focusing on how much of a moat and, and how how little competition generally exists uh, if you're building hardware and if you're focusing on sustainability. We've seen that uh, work uh, firsthand. If you invest in the in the first few years of, of building all of this out, if you invest in creating a community, if you invest in, 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 in uh, bringing out the impact, uh, by the time your business starts scaling up, there is limited competition uh, because it's it's just harder. The entry barrier is just, just so much higher. Uh, and the companies that do manage to survive for the first few years manage to grow really fast. Um, and that's when the true hockey stake growth kicks in and it kicks in with real revenue and real users. Um, so I think those are two things. You attract patient investors. You, uh, you can... Um, uh, you have to focus a lot, however, on, on how strong your moats are going to be, uh, how, how you'll be able to easily avoid competition, the likes that that, that comes across in, in, in other business models, uh, and just the size of the sector. Uh, for example, electric vehicles in India. This is a $250 billion industry that's popping out of thin air in the next 10 years. Incredibly exciting time to be building electric in India. And uh, companies that have gone through the first few years of you know the grind to get here, just have an incredibly great shot and not scaling up with very limited competition. Um, those would be my pieces of advice uh, and, and and just our perspective on, on how capital uh, raise, raises have worked in these sectors. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christian Sands. I am the founder and CEO of Skycatch. Our technology in a nutshell increases visibility into the physical world at a very fast pace. Our data is a richer source of information than the human eye. Helping our customers achieve or get to zero waste is at the core of what Skycatch does. We do this by giving customers the ability to see everything that's happening on all their projects with a click of a button. When we do this, they can avoid delays, they can avoid mistakes, or any other issue that causes waste. In fact, this is what got the interest of ADB initially. With COVID-19, visibility into their projects became very difficult. They wanted a better way to remotely see everything that's happening across all their projects. We've been working with Komatsu for many years now with great success. We get a lot of interest and requests from the region uh, and knowing who to work with is very, very difficult. So having ADB act as a filter, guiding us as to which companies which are the right companies to work with, with the good business practices and good policies, it has been incredibly beneficial to us. And of course, having the endorsement and backing of ADB uh, just removes the obstacle that you typically have with some of these big organizations and government agencies. The only advice that I would give to other entrepreneurs who are trying to successfully expand into Asia Pacific and to help move sustainable development goals, including zero waste uh, forward. Uh, I, you know, the only thing that comes to mind right now is ADB, work with ADB. <laughs> work with ADB, also make the investment, make that trip, make that connection with companies in Asia Pacific 
and, and take the time to explore. You'd be surprised how many opportunities are hidden in Asia Pacific. You just have to make the investment. Thank you for that. Uh, and I really appreciate all the different views that you've provided. Really interesting information and um, looking forward to hearing more from you. So um, I have a few questions uh, that I'm going to ask. And, and first, I, I wanted to ask about the enabling environment. So Deputy Minister Cha, I have first question will be directed to you. Um, Korea is unique since 2017 in having a ministry dedicated to startups and SMEs. Why has the current government put this emphasis on startups and SMEs as an economic engine? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having, having me the questions. Uh, the Korea government has established and operated small and medium business administrations since 1996 to support SME and startups. Following the inauguration of President Moon Jae-in, its status was raised to ministry in July 2017. It changed its name to Ministry of SME and Startups, and the organization was extended as well. It is an evidence that SME and Startups are playing a critical role for Korea economy right now. And it demonstrates the government's strong will to support their growth for paradigm shift to a new economy. Previously, the development of Korea economy has been led by uh, such a large domestic company, company well known to you as such as Samsung, LG, Hyundai as an uh, example of this. However, this type of uh, economic development has a sort of a limitation right now. The Korea government has chosen SME and startup as a tool to remark a major shift regarding the growth pattern of national economy. Approximately 99% of Korea companies are SME and startup, and they count for more than 80% of employment right now. To this end, we want to develop the economy all together with our people based on growth and innovation of SME and startups. Unlike large, large company, they are highly adaptive to change and innovate so they tended to lead the trend. Also, they are outstanding in responding to the crisis. Particularly, SME and startup in Korea has emerged as driver for growth in COVID-19 pandemics. They have already established themselves as a new growth engine for the national economies. Thank you for that. Um, um, it's very encouraging that the government has really taken on board uh, and really emphasized uh, the importance of SMEs within the economy. So following on from that, I have another question for you um, with regards to some of the, the policy aspect, because uh, Korea has a matrix of policies to enhance the competitiveness of startups, accelerate the startup boom, support innovation and institute a fair economy for startup innovation. What are the highlights? What policies have most to accelerate growth of Korea's economy? Um, the highlight of a startup policy of Korea government is support them by building a foundation for self-sustaining ecosystem through private sector engagement. These two principles are the key element of the policy to develop Korea startup economies. The government proactively support areas that are promising, but not, not noticed or recognized as significant and encourage the private sector to join. With regard to this, I would like to introduce two government representative, uh, representative policies. They are Fund of Fund and TIPS. Since 2005, MSS has created and managed the fund of fund with a large government budget to help SME and startup attract, attract investment. Investment to startup in Korea has increased each year for recent five years. In particular, Korea venture investment hit record high last year despite of COVID-19. This means that fund of fund serves the role of attracting private funds to the venture investment market. 
It also means that the venture ecosystem finally begin to grow by themselves. Second, KIPS uh, stands for Tech Incubator Program for Startup. is one of the national representative incubator program for startups. Specifically, it focuses on selecting and incubating promising startup with the world leading technology items and such efforts are largely led by private sectors. Since 2013, we have supported 1,234 startups in total. It can be said that 10 startup read, uh, readers among nine, uh, 15 CEO who are included, included in the Forbes 30 on the age 30 Asia class of 2021 were able to su uh, successfully grow their companies as they are today. As you can see, startup policy of Korea government are not only limited to only to improve cash by the government. Rather, you focus on helping startup develop self-sustaining power so that they continue to grow by cooperating with the private sector engagement. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, very much appreciate that, you know, the very comprehensive efforts that the government has taken. So I have one last question for you. And so, for example, if you were advising uh, the government of an emerging market economy on how to build a robust startup economy. What lessons would you draw from Korea's example? Uh, actually, to, to build a robust startup economy, you need to build a system in general. I also like to recommend you to be equipped with the essential elements that are required to incubate and grow startups. Of course, there are many things to consider, but I believe the human resource, technology, and capital are the key fundamentals. To nurture talent who will lead a startup, technical personal training program should be provided based on the cooperation between the ac academy and industry together. Also, there is a need, uh, need to uh, utilize stock option plan to recruit talented employee. Second, you need to support for R&D to help a startup develop their own technology and grow further and facilitate the technology transfer for commercialization of innovative technology to foster tech-based startups. Lastly, measure for financial support to help a company focusing their own growth without facing difficulty in securing funds should be also provided. Loan, guarantee, and other options can be examples of such financial support. What is important here is pro proactive investment to venture capital for those with a promising idea about reg of fund. With to create a fund of fund with, uh, with the aim of encouraging venture investment. Only when we have built this basic ecosystem and embark of program to nurture entrepreneurs and commercialize technology and support for their scale up based on them then we can expect to see sustain, uh, substantial outcomes. The process to sophisticate and improve program in more effective way will accompany naturally while learning dance. Tips is also classified into pre-tips and tips and post-tips to provide a different type of support the growth, uh, based on the growth, growing stages. For government of an emerging market economy to develop a policy, I recommend you it to cooperate with other countries to learn their systems and benchmark proactively. We MSS ready to help you by cooperating with you to grow together. Excellent. Thank you very much for your response. Uh, very encouraged of the support that the, the Korean government can and advice that you can provide. Um, next, I wanted to uh, move over to Ritu. I, I had some questions for you about India and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, India has been severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, the things that we're seeing in the news. What role does technology have to play in making India and its neighbors more resilient to future pandemic events? Thank you, Suzanne. Um, Obviously, we are going through quite an extreme crisis at this moment in India. Uh, and I think that technology, of course, has a huge role to play. 
Uh, and that's partially because of the distributed nature of how the country uh, is structured from, you know, really dense cities to far-flung villages. And uh, in order to, you know, bridge the gap of the infrastructure variances uh, across the country, um, as well as in metro areas that's what's happening right now, I think technology is just ultimately something that has to come in play. So I'll give you a live example of sort of, uh, you know, I, I mean, using digital to be able to actually teleconsult in these days is actually super critical, right? And that works whether you live in a large metro area or whether you live in a far flung uh, village today. And, you know, it's digital technologies that can actually help bridge these gaps to bring resources that are sitting in much resource rich areas to places that are research, resource poor. And I think those have a huge role to play. So health is obviously one of those, but you know, as we discovered in the first part of this pandemic that, you know, keeping supply chains open, you know, a couple of uh, panelists here mentioned, you know, how could you remotely monitor things happening in different locations when travel, et cetera, is not advisable. A lot of digital technology is coming to play to actually build these connects when these things are broken. So uh, some of these things were broken in India pre-pandemic as well, right? It takes a long time to go visit a site, right? If you could do that remotely, why not? So those, I think, are important. I think the second is also something that we cannot ignore. Uh, you know, uh, development of products is absolutely critical that work in these kind of resource settings. So, you know, uh, ventilators, or whether there are oxygen concentrators or, you know, things, you know, things that are kind of relevant for these kind of market structures and can be built and maintained in different areas is very important. I don't think you can quite follow the same route of saying that there's very, very high capex that is necessary. So innovations in critical areas that allow access in a much, much broader manner is also something that is very critical. And you see some of that emerging, right? You know, people trying to build ventilators that are built, uh, you know, cheaper, better, uh, that can work with very little you know, skilled interventions, all of those things are still innovations to happen, but would be obviously very useful in a situation like this. No, thank you for that. So you've almost partially uh, answered uh, the second question I was going to ask you, and it was about, you know, because the fact that uh, Anchor Capital has a, a significant portfolio in health tech investments. So I get my other question was going, you know, was, you know, how has the COVID pandemic affected the outlook for health technology and startups? But, you know, maybe you could just kind of uh, follow on a little bit on that. Yeah, sure. Um, there are two ways that we've seen that this has impacted it, right? So obviously COVID in the medical and the healthcare community has kind of driven focus primarily towards COVID. So anything that helps in actual, you know, distance medical interventions through technology, as I said earlier, teleconsulting, et cetera, all have tailwinds behind them. Anything that helps in digital supply chains in medical have tailwinds behind them, right? So those actually are seeing adoption happen. And as we say here in India, you know, what would have taken the next five years is happening in six months because we're forced into this at this point of time. But there is a part of healthcare which is not, uh, you know, uh, let's say linked directly to the crisis, right? So if you are somewhere in a preventative healthcare, if you are uh, looking at diseases or chronic diseases or chronic disease diagnosis management, you know, those have actually taken a hit because the medical community is now wholly focused on the COVID situation. And, you know, that doesn't lend to you getting elective surgeries or preventative surgeries. You know, you've got to be fairly critical, both from a patient's perspective as well as the medical community entertaining you in this. And that we have seen. So for example, we're invested in a breast cancer detection and early de detection of breast cancer. They've had a hard time because hospitals don't want you around, clinics don't want you, want you around because priority right now is COVID. So it's a dual-edged sword here. 
Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your insights and really appreciate the work that you're doing in the space, which is really, really important. Um, next, I just, I wanted to move over to a few, a little bit of some of the regional challenges to so, um so Jojo, I wanted to ask you, um, Plug and Play is involved in commercializing early stage uh, technology in Europe, North America, and Asia. And within Asia, <clears throat> you're in uh, two emerging markets, Indonesia and Thailand. What are some of the unique challenges you've observed in commercializing technologies in Asia's emerging markets? Thank you, Suzanne. Well, some of the challenges uh, we've seen are that there are not enough large corporations in Southeast Asia for the hard tech and uh, sustainability startups to test and implement their technologies with. Uh, most of the uh, potential customers for these startups are based out of North America or Europe. Uh, this creates a logistical hurdle for startups to work with potential partners. In addition, if a startup is working on uh, chemical recycling, for example, the front end infrastructure in advanced waste sorting might not be there, or the startup might not be able to sell its high value chemical compounds because their customers are in North America or, or Europe. Uh, this impacts the unit economics of uh, chemical recycling systems and makes it more difficult uh, to build technology in Southeast Asia, and hence uh, may be more favorable to build it in Europe as a result. These hurdles are also reflected in the trends we are seeing in the startup ecosystem. Uh, we have seen that the number of startups currently working on chemical recycling is directly proportional to the number of chemical and oil, oil and gas companies in the same regions. In addition, there is not uh, enough public and private uh, capital being deployed at this moment in these hard tech sustainability startups. This is part of the reason why companies like ADB and Alliance to, to uh, end plastic waste and plug and play are vitally important to build up the ecosystems in these regions and bring all of the major players together to help scale up the technology become their customers and uh, deploy capital into these young startups to help boost up the entire industry. Excellent, thank you very much for that. I just wanted to follow up with a question with Chris from Skycatch. Um, Asia and Pacific are fragmented. They differ in business enabling policy, uh, environment, language, culture, and of course, market size. How should companies like Skycatch trying to expand into the region from overseas approach this fragmentation? Hi, Suzanne. Thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I think I, I responded to that on my video. Um, I, I, said, I basically said work with organizations that can help you pull into Asia Pacific. Uh, we work very closely with Japanese companies that deploy into Asia Pacific, like Komatsu. Um, we work with them for a long time. Uh, now we work with ADB, uh, work with organizations that have good reputation uh, and they're big enough to pull you into these regions. That's what, that's the strategy that we use that was recommended by our advisors and our investors. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, for additional clarification. I just wanted to follow on from, from that, and, you know, in that, uh, you know, could you uh, share a case study of a particularly challenging project in Asia Pacific region uh, and uh, talk about how Skycatch overcame those challenges? Absolutely. Uh, one of the challenges that, right, there's two of them that I can speak of. Um, one in China, uh, Goldwind, it's one of our investors. It's the second largest wind, uh, wind farm manufacturer, wind turbine manufacturer. Uh, they had a big challenge of aging infrastructure and being able to, to see these changes and being able to get ahead of these, change, uh, these changes and aging, aging infrastructure was very important to them. 
um, for them to scale and continue to scale within China and everywhere else. So being able to inspect uh, and automate the, the process of inspection was very, was very critical to them many years ago, and that was part of the reason why they invested. So that was one of them. Uh, it's collaborating with them and all of their teams to bring this new technology, this new way of automating disability into a site um, was very critical, not only for them to scale, but also for their resiliency for their customers. Uh, the second one was um, with uh, Komatsu. Uh, labor shortage is uh, increasing uh, rapidly. Um, people are not training on how to drive equipment, heavy equipment anymore, as much as they used to. And so being able to um, automate equipment so that it makes it very easy for a high school student to drive equipment uh, became very critical for Komatsu in 2015. So our technology gives visibility to heavy equipment so that a high school student or someone with very minimal education can drive equipment very quickly. In 2018, we deployed in over 10,000 sites in Asia Pacific uh, by facilitating this new technology. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, as one of those high school students myself who drove uh, equipment on a farm, I, I do understand exactly what you're saying. Um, Tarun, I wanted to ask you the next question. Um, and if you could give a little bit more regional flavor, uh, uh, Anther Energy has been success, uh, um, I should say, highly successful in fundraising. Last year, as we talked about, you, you had raised uh, $35 million in uh, Series uh, D. And so what have you been your secrets to success? Um, fundraising is not success, but um, um, we've, we've been lucky to have uh, a few really good investors back us over multiple rounds. A um, few things that um, have worked for us over the last few rounds. We, we, we've stuck to a strategy. Uh, our strategy was build um, build high quality electric vehicles, something that that has aspirational value. Uh, and the thesis was that only if people are excited about buying electric, only then you know the market will start shifting. Uh, this is this has been very different from a lot of other incumbents in the market who have been trying to build the lowest cost EV first. Uh, we believe that to build the lowest cost EV, you need the engineering architectures in place. And to invest in those engineering architectures and to get them to those uh, cost structures, you need a, a very successful uh, and aspirational product first. So we kind of stuck to our uh, thesis and strategy over the last several years. Um, and that's kind of gotten more and more data, more and more positive data around it over multiple funding, funding rounds. So that was our pitch from the seed round all the way up to CDC, right? And it's gotten just more and more better data uh, validating it over every single round. So sticking to our thesis has helped us. Um, also, we've been very focused on, on on lowering the overall cost, on, on investing in the in, in in the engineering architectures for electric vehicle power trains. So while we while we began at a high cost point, our our our, our, our idea was that if all capital that we're raising will go in the first five years in, in establishing product market fit. And then the next wave will go in, in, in lowering the cost architectures uh, to one of the lowest points in the industry. So that's how we positioned our multiple fundraisers and, and I think that's what's worked for us. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, Next, I wanted to move on to another area that I wanted to ask some questions about impact technologies. And, and next question, I wanted to, to uh, ask Jojo. Um, so for example, plug and, plug and play uh, began as a fairly typical Silicon Valley early stage uh, technology VC. But in recent years, as you've mentioned, uh, your, your interest in sustainable development has visibly grown. What's driving plug and play's interest in this new era? <clears throat> uh, yeah, plug and play has actually been working uh, and uh, investing in sustainability focused startups uh, for years through our other industry verticals. But we have decided to create a dedicated sustainability program because we were noticing that uh, some of our startups were not getting the attention they deserved 
uh, in our other accelerator vertical programs. So uh, we created this program so that we can shine a uh, spotlight on these uh, great startups and to demonstrate to the corporations that sustainability is no longer a nice to have, but be a must have in their company and in the industry as a whole. So uh, we also wanted to demonstrate to those uh, same companies that uh, you become more sustainable without sacrificing profitability. Uh, there has also been a notable shift in the sustainability mindset globally, and we wanted to be the leading, to be the leader in in, in charging, uh, in accelerating these startups, and also invest in them. So uh, in addition to our accelerator programs, uh, as I, I mentioned in my uh, opening remarks, Plug and Play has also invested already in 17 startups in the last uh, 18 months, and uh, we hope uh, to be doing more in the next years. Excellent, thank you very much for that. I think that you brought up the, the topic of impact versus return, which is always a continual discussion. Um, but I wanted to also ask you, because you've mentioned uh, quite a number of times that you've uh, partnered up with Alliance and Plastic uh, Waste um, to accelerate promising circular economy technologies. And, and so what are some of the ways that innovative startups are, are cha changing how uh, emerging Asia manages solid waste? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, plug and play and the Alliance uh... Uh, and a startup called uh, Literati uh, launched a Clean for Change campaign last week, actually in Singapore, with the Ministry of uh, Sustainability. This is a global clean up uh, campaign running for 150 days, where people from all around the world can take part in uh, cleanup efforts. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the campaign also promotes innovative startups that are working on advanced waste sorting and uh, transforming plastic waste into value goods, either through a mechanical or chemical recycling process. Uh, we are not only accelerating local startups in these spaces, but we are also helping to bring these startups from other parts of the world such as Southeast Asia, so that they can also contribute to help make the region more, su more sustainable and manage its solid waste in a more efficient and uh, effective manner. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone in the audience that you're welcome to pose questions to our panel. Um, we have some other questions already uh, ready for them uh, because of the interesting topic, but you know, always uh, uh, welcome to hear your thoughts and your views. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask for, on, from Ritu, um, and um, again, it's about uh, technology, but also on agritech. You have a significant portfolio of agritech, and you did mention it with some of the, your comments that you had made earlier. Why did you decide to focus on the agricultural vertical? And what are some of the challenges for VC investors in this space? Thanks for the question, Suzanne. I think we've been doing agri-tech now since 2012, and I can safely say that that word didn't exist when we started investing there. But um, I think what was interesting and exciting to us, I mean, obviously agriculture and food is a massive industry in India, it's a $450 billion industry as a whole. And there was very little that had happened in terms of disruption. The second part of it that I would say is that, you know, you know, we were an impact and we are an impact focused fund. And so here were a whole lot of smallholders and forming the majority of the backbone of people uh, in India. And, uh, you know, if you were going to change anything, you had to start talking about what you could do for farmers. And the third uh, was, you know, much more on ground piece. You know, in 2012, 2013, what you would see is that these phones were making their way into uh, rural areas. So you saw digital technology actually coming in for other reasons. And I would say primarily entertainment actually, and the need to communicate with friends and family. But however, 
you know, it was a tool that was there now, or was coming there in people's hands. Yes, it was not the smartphone, it was the old style phones, feature phones, but that was making inroads. So I think these three factors uh, made it a very interesting place for us to take a look and say that, look, as you go along, um, any fragment in system needs aggregation. And mm -hmm. here was technology that was coming in that could provide virtual aggregation layers and two-way communication layers. We'd, we'd been able to broadcast in the past through TV or radio, but now you were able to individualize that and actually have a conversation. So I think these factors made us super interested in AgTech at that point of time. And we've just seen that grow over the years. And thank you for that. I wanted to follow on another question with regards to the ag tech space and and some of the specific challenges that uh, ag, wow. ag tech uh, investors are, are facing um, in trying to scale their investments. And, and maybe you can give some examples on, on some of the things that you've seen. Absolutely. So it's not necessarily an easy path. Um, I think there are a couple of challenges here. Uh, one I will mention up front is capital. And till very recently, I think it has been an offbeat sector. And partially because majority of us, the majority of us who do financing are sort of disassociated from our food supply chains because it just shows up on our plate. So we're not really cognizant. And that's true of financiers as well as entrepreneurs. But I think that has changed over the last year or so. The second is sort of driving scale. So one of the challenges of sort of driving scale is that uh, you know there are different customer needs, if I can call farmers customers, across the board, and they're different crops. And there's a lot of uh, idiosyncrasies and nuances to each of these. So in order to be able to scale, you know, perhaps every 50 kilometers, you need to be addressing some of these nuances here. So your, your product market fit has to get tweaked, and that sort of limits scale. Uh, the second part about, so you've got to find things that cut across right, in order to get into the door and then start adding these nuances. And that's kind of how it, how it works. Um, the second piece I would sort of mention is that, uh, you know, you have to go uh, to get much larger scale. Partnerships in the system is very necessary. Mm -hmm. So there are different actors that have partnerships down to the ground level or into the supply chains. And for you to be able to convince the actors in the chain that, uh, you know, your technology is not only beneficial to farmers or other people, smaller people in the supply chains, but to you as a entity, whether you're the government, whether you're a corporate, whether you're a not-for-profit or an aid agency, is, uh, you know, adds to the complexity, right? So you need a value proposition for them, you need a value proposition for that to be used. So I think you have to marry these things together. But when you see that marriage happening, and you see, you find product market fit for a larger segment, and you start building the nuances, you see scale coming in. Thank you for that. I have one more question for you on the ag tech space and the challenges of agri-tech uh, entrepreneurs uh, and th that they're facing in smaller markets such as uh, Vietnam or Indonesia, which uh, which are different from uh, the challenges from uh, in the in, in India. And maybe you could describe a little bit of that. So I'll caveat that, that my view of uh, agriculture in Southeast Asia, with a lot of people may know a lot more about it, has been through our portfolio investee companies and sort of what they see when they go to the markets. Um, I will add that what has surprised me the most is the similarities that there are. Uh, a lot of market structures are very, very similar to how India works, and I would argue small farm holding markets, just because they provide long chains, because aggregation and movement of goods is, that's how we have dealt with it in the past. Having said that, I think that we do see some, some differences. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the challenges perhaps is that uh, different markets, especially in Southeast Asia, may have different levels of digital penetration for digitally led technologies to actually sort of penetrate. Uh, the actors that you end up working with can be both very local or they could be banned. So somewhere those structures of the intermediaries in the system, whether they're corporates or whether they are you know, other kind of agencies that stay in the middle, 
those are structurally different. And the third is the, uh, the crops and the nature of the crops and the economics of the crops, uh, which can vary, where, uh, which it, whether it allows such interventions to happen or not. So those are the three areas that I would say that from our portfolio companies of what we've seen are differences between India and Southeast Asia uh, that, that sort of need to get bridged. But there is a really a lot that is very, very similar. And we've seen that scale across multiple of these geographies. So that's a very large positive that we see. OK, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to move on to uh, Tarun and ask you a question about uh, electric vehicle startups, um, which are hot right now globally, I think, uh, generally with venture capitalists, and especially hot in India, as you've already uh, mentioned. And what do you think is fueling the hot market for EV startups? I think it's a mix of a lot of things. Um, public, public perception has certainly helped in the last one year in, in a market like India where a lot of customers have suddenly started looking at electric as an upgrade for them. Um, and which, which really helps because if you've got to convince people to, to buy electric for the environment, that's a much harder sell. But if people imagine that, you know, every electric is a status line as an upgrade, uh, then it's so much easier. And, and the addressable market size is so much larger. I think also what's happened with the passenger car market globally, um, most people now do believe that it's investors or, or suppliers or the oral industry that uh, electrification is imminent. Um, and most people now believe that 100% electrification is imminent. And certainly that's changing everybody's perception about the market size considerably. Uh, to give you a sense, uh, until like even a year back or even like nine months back, most analysts uh, were predicting in, in a, a penetration in the Indian light electric vehicle market, which is the two-wheeler market, the scooter and bike market, uh, a penetration of about 15 to 20 percent by 2030. That's a decade from now. Um, but a lot has changed in the last year, and now almost every prediction has moved to a 30 percent penetration by 2025, and, and close to 70 to 80 percent by the end of the decade. Um, and that's and, and and that's and that basically means at that point supply creation is the problem. Um, and certainly every every EV story looks so much bigger, or like almost 10x bigger than a year back. Uh, uh, I, I said this in, in, the, in the video also, that from, from this being a segment, you know, which could be a three, four, five billion dollar market in the next few years, certainly it looks like a 200 billion dollar plus market in the next decade. Um, investments will flow corresponding to the, to the market size and the probability of, of that market actually happening. And I think that's what's happening with electric. Uh, also, last thing, cost structures have evolved quite dramatically. While we've been all looking at the cost of batteries for a long time, and that's obviously improved considerably. Um, the overall EV supply chain for things like electronics, uh, your powertrain, your motor controller, everything's come down considerably in the last couple of years, making a lot of form factors for electric suddenly very, very viable. And for the most part, uh, cheaper than petrol alternatives. Uh, so that's driving a lot of the current um, excitement around electric in India and many of the markets. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I wanted to take uh, the opportunity now to, to uh, take a few questions from the audience. And we have uh, some uh, very interesting ones. And, and Jojo, I wanted to ask you the first one. Um, and so the question is is coming, uh, how can uh, NGOs uh, Get, become involved in uh, supporting the circular economy activities in sectors uh, that have the platform for plug and play um, and in which you're operating. So, so you know, how, how can NGOs uh, become involved and to support that? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, actually plug and play, I'd like to think of it as, as, uh, as a platform. So uh, we do, we, uh, at the right smack in the middle of it, uh, startups obviously, but uh, are around it are governments, government entities, corporations, universities, uh, as well as uh, corporations. You know that, uh, and uh, of course, part of that ecosystem are also NGOs. So uh, just uh, we are present. We do have boots on the ground in Indonesia, in Thailand, 
in, in Singapore, uh, in the Philippines, uh, and uh, Hong Kong, uh, as well as uh, China, Korea, and Japan. So uh, just uh, please uh, just reach out to us, and uh, we're, we're happy to collaborate with in any way we, we can. Okay, and and thank you for that. I just have one more question about from your perspective is, is that what do you see as the um, the current environment for startups in the Philippines? Uh, you know, just your views on on the where where things stand. Uh, it could be better. Uh, right now, the the we are falling behind in terms of number. Uh, of uh, new startups that enter the market uh, compared to our uh, ASEAN uh, neighbors, uh, uh, which is also reflected with uh, by the by the amount of investments that uh, the country or the startups receive here locally. Now, having said that, I, I think uh, that uh, the government is. Uh, pushing hard in uh, trying to build that ecosystem. Uh, about two years ago, we had the Startup Innovative Act and the things are in motion right now in order to uh, help boost that. No? And I've been working closely with the Department of Trade and Industry, with the Department of uh, Science and Technology in order for us to see what are the missing gaps and uh, try to uh, fill those uh, either through government support or, or private support. So uh, we are uh, looking into uh, building more the uh, uh, investment community through early stage uh, uh, players. Uh, so hopefully, uh, we'll see a better development in the next few years. As well, uh, we are working very closely with uh, the state universities in the country, uh, uh, which has more than 2 million students uh, at any given time. So I, I really think that that's a great opportunity for us to uh, develop more startups going into the future. Okay, no, thank you for that. Um, I now have a, a, a different type of question, and I'll direct it initially to Chris. Um, what are the top one or two policy or regulatory challenges that you have faced in your respective areas and regions or countries in which you've worked? Thanks, Susan, for the question. Yeah, what, what challenges have we faced on the regulatory side, you know, when operating drone technology or aer aerial technology. Um, you know, uh, early on when we first started in 2013 and when we first, um, you know, started to deploy in Asia Pacific around 2015 and 2016, the rules weren't very solid. And so it was much easier for us to uh, deploy and uh, there was great area everywhere. It was in 2017 and 18 that things got a little bit more strict um, but you know again working with larger organizations uh, government agencies uh, and, and showcasing working with them and showcasing the benefit the, the long-term benefit this has not only for for commercial companies at, at, at different regions but also for the government um, plays a big role so actively uh, educating the governments uh, actively educating um, the, you know, the leadership at, at the different companies on how to approach this uh, has been part of the journey. Thank you for that. Um, so now I'll take a, a kind of a, like a, a different uh, perspective. So uh, Deputy Minister Cha, if, if I could ask you the same question, but from the other side, um, what have been the priority, the regulatory changes that you thought were the most area, uh, the important areas that needed to uh, change when you became involved and, and uh, you know, with the setup of the, um, the SME uh, um, uh, the ministry and stuff, what was the priority there uh, that you were addressing that you thought from the private sector? Questions? Uh, actually, the priority-wise, priority uh, Korea government has been developing the two major regulatory-related places, which is uh, the, 
The first one is a regulatory sandbox, which was, uh, which was operated all around the world. And secondly, the MSS standpoint, we are designating and, and dedicating the specific zone, which is a regulatory free zone. And in, the, in, that, in that specific uh, regulatory free zones, the, all of the startup can gather together and they, they walk through the, uh, the, all of the, the regulatory pre, uh, the piloting project by themselves. Luckily, mm. uh, AV, AV testing and AV the data gathering and blockchain and blockchain technology and sort of a DNA or some, some genome technology, et cetera. So, Korea government has been has been setting almost 20 regulatory pre zones in in local area together, and all of the startup and and, and SME and gather to get, gathering together, and they are actively piloting their technology pre from the regulatory. That is the priority right now. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Ritu, I wanted to ask you a question about some of the specific challenges that women founders have faced when fundraising, uh, both globally and specifically in Asia Pacific. You know, I've heard lots of stories over the years, but, you know, I'm, I'd be interested to hear what your views are, are on that. I think as a, as a funder, the biggest challenge I face is, is that we don't see enough women entrepreneurs. And... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, so from a supply perspective, uh, you know, I'm still wondering why. And so, uh, you know, we've been part of initiatives deeper down to sort of understand what are the challenges? Why is it that, uh, you know, we don't have a 50-50 mix here? Um, and I think those, uh, you know, are fairly specific. I think there are, there are pieces around the fact that women just don't go out to approach funding or they are looking for much different metrics before they even consider it, uh, that limits it. So there seems to be a lot of people, women out there who are founders, uh, but they don't necessarily go reach out to here. I mean, that's not to say that the environment is perfect for women to reach out for funding. Uh, there's obviously a lot to be done. There's a lot more diversity that is needed across the board here, which doesn't exist today. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, but that is also needs to be addressed here. One other piece I think is missing is enough role models and enough, mm -hmm. uh, you know, examples along the way to say, look, so-and-so did it, why can't you? Um, and uh, I think the ecosystem needs to work a lot harder to create those role models to perhaps encourage many more women at all levels, whether it's at entrepreneurs, whether it's at the intermediary level, to sort of bring the balance and diversity that is much needed here. Yeah. No, important topic and one that we're uh, um, very much interested in following and, <clears throat> excuse me, supporting. Uh, Tarun, I had a question for you. And uh, the question is, is as a relatively late uh, stage startup, uh, what could you do differently or better uh, when you look back through your journey in the last several years? Uh, I'd say we, 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 could, we could do with a little bit more focus. Um, while the vision is large, it, I, 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 I think um, we, we, we've been working on a lot of topics, a lot of technologies, uh, a lot of product expansion very early on. Um, so if I could go back in time and change one thing, I would say I'll, I'll bring a little bit more focus. Um, it, it, it's hard at the early stages because, because working on, you know, like, like all parts of the value chain kind of, you know, gives that it gives a lot of excitement and you know um, keeps everybody super motivated but 100 percent not the best use of resources at an, at an earlier stage so i, I would say I, I would focus i bring a lot more focus it is general advice that every founder get uh, i think every startup has it has, has the investors board members everybody telling them at the early stages but i think it's the one that's probably the hardest to sort of uh, stick with especially for first time entrepreneurs. 
So whatever it is worth, I'll just repeat. Our learning has been very similar as many other startups, more focused on the early stages. Yeah, it's hard to kind of funnel all those ideas which are there and prioritizing them. That's, that's hard, I, I do understand that. Jojo, I have a question for you. Um, and the question is, Plug and Play uh, has a Bangkok-based uh, Smart Cities Innovation Program. What are some of the key challenges in making Asian uh, cities smarter and more sustainable? And how can they be addressed through technology? Thanks, Suzanne. Um, so, so we launched uh, the Thailand Smart Cities program in uh, late 2019 with a few of the largest Thai-based multinational cor corp companies. Uh, our technology focus areas include uh, real estate uh, and construction, mobility and IoT, energy and health. So our objective is to make Thailand the Asian hub for smart cities innovation by bringing together the key players from all the relevant industries across continents, connecting the best technology startups to corporations, governments, and uh, as investors as well. Although Thailand, along with the other Asian ASEAN countries, are, are collaboratively uh, working together on the Smart Cities Network, or ASCN, a platform which aims uh, to unify smart city development efforts across uh, ASEAN. The implementation, however, uh, and the progress has uh, still, is still, be, uh, is still a little slow. Uh, some of the challenges of implementing the smart city in, uh, in, in this area include uh, the uh, availability of data and uh, information, uh, security uh, and privacy, uh, large uh, investment or capital requirement, uh, as well as IT infrastructure. Uh, in addition, you have also social adaptation and uh, uh, application developments uh, in, in those uh, in those uh, uh, industries that I mentioned. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think that uh, there's lots of work to do and, and lots of inspiration that you're providing on that. Um, Ritu, I wanted to go to you for uh, maybe as our final question. Um, and uh, it's come from our audience. So the question is, is, are all Asian countries able to develop digitization and technology for risk uh, venture investments? And what what's necessary as a preliminary condition for that um, uh, to be created so that it can be created in each uh, country in Asia? So, well, Suzanne, let me let me make sure I understand. So, can this happen in every Asian country? Is that the question? Yeah, and and what uh, are are all Asian countries able to develop this digital uh, develop digitization and technology for? the type of VC investments that you're doing? So I think there are two characteristics that a VC investment needs, right? It needs scale and it needs, uh, so that means a large addressable market here. And the second is it has to grow rapidly, right? So it's, it, you know, it, 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 it has to happen in a period of time that makes returns possible for, a, um, for the investor here. So uh, some Asian countries might be too small from a addressable market size, but that doesn't mean that it cross border, you couldn't take a look at the size of that market and say this is large enough here. So I think I would encourage people to think about, you know, customers that cross borders. Uh, and I definitely think that that is completely investable. As far as digital goes, I think that's here to stay. And, mm. uh, you know, the penetration, you know, we have these arguments in India all the time, you know, I mean, do, do these people have it or not? But as a trend, I mean, we do believe that, look, this is going to, you know, this is not going away. And that is going to continue to happen. And I believe that will happen across Asia. So I don't think that even if there are people who are countries that are right now not there, I think it's a question of time as to when they will sort of get there. So um, I would just encourage entrepreneurs to think about building for cro across markets 
problems if the if their own immediate market is very small. And I definitely think that digital solutions can happen pan India, pan uh, Asia. Sorry. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to thank all the analysts or the uh, panelists for your uh, fantastic presentations. Um, and uh, I just wanted to go into our concluding remarks. And, you know, I, w I wanted to say that I'm concluding or closing today's session uh, feeling very optimistic. There is an enormous amount of energy and momentum in the private sector that aligns with ADB's uh, vision of a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. I believe that the private sector innovation and investment will make uh, big contributions, significant contributions to a, to a sustainable recovery and to a more sustainable and resilient region over the longer term. However, it's also clear that more needs to be done. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, our region was off track to accomplish the sustainable development goals. ADB estimates that Asia uh, will need to invest some $200 billion annually until 2030 related to climate change mitigation and adaptation costs alone. Our ADB Ventures facility has a goal of crowding in more than $1 billion of risk capital towards the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, which can only address a small portion of the region's needs. Partnerships will be a key success factor. And this is something that we're starting to see much more between not only uh, the investors on the ground, but within the, within the development finance institutions. And we're very grateful for our partnership with the government of the Republic of Korea, which along with the Finnish government, the Climate Technology Fund and the Nordic Development Fund has invested in ADB Ventures' first equity fund. We are grateful to our private sector co-investors like Anchor Capital and Plug and Play, the, last, the latter of which was also con uh, contributed uh, significantly to our technical assistance activities. And we are especially grateful uh, to the impact of technology entrepreneurs like Anthro Energy and Skycatch that are applying their talent and energy and taking on significant risk to advance the sustainable development goals. This concludes today's session. Thank you once again to all our panelists and to all of you who joined us today.